Hello everybody, and now let's consider the various climates in the nation of Israel. How can a country, considering what's shown in the red as Israeli controlled territory, which is roughly the size of the state of New Jersey, how can it have such diverse climates? When you consider the size, even considering all of the uh, contested territories, uh, the region is just over 10,000 square miles, 263 miles north to south and 71 miles at the widest point. But yet such a small region has snow-capped Mount Hermon and within seeing range on a clear day, the lowest elevation on earth surrounding the Dead Sea barren deserts, but yet within seeing range, regions that has a four season growing crop season. Arid, hot, intolerable, but yet regions with cloud rainforest. When you climb Mount Hermon on the western side, it's as though you're in a South American jungle, um, lush green trees, wet moss, springs coming from the hillside and all locations, uh, very humid. How can all of this be? Part of the Fertile Crescent, but yet a toxic sea, a naturally occurring toxic sea in the Dead Sea. How can all of this variation occur in such a small region? Well, we could only explain this by the differing climates uh, affected by weather patterns and by the landforms that uh, affect airflow. Uh, if we were to summarize this, uh, we would say it: it is as simple as the prevailing winds coming from the west over the Mediterranean Sea bringing much moisture into the region of Israel but not being able to clear the uh, mountains of Israel. Therefore all of the moisture stays between the Judean mountain range and the Mediterranean making one side very um, very appropriate for agriculture, the other side of the Judean mountains, barren desert. And we'll explain uh, more of that in detail, uh, but recognizing that when we think of the Middle East, certainly we think of sand-filled barren desert as shown in this diagram and also uh, on map uh, on page 27 in your textbook. Notice the Fertile Crescent is green and brown, brown being the highest mountain regions. And you can see the Tigris and Euphrates River above the word Iraq. And while it is in a barren desert land, it still has flowing rivers during most of the year, which as we've talked about with Mesopotamia, could be dammed and used for irrigation throughout the dry season. So there's a lot of variation. There uh, is a clear lines of delineation. Within one mile, you can go from a lush green uh, farmland to barren desert, thanks to uh, modern day irrigation, and find a whole different type of um, culture based upon uh, these climates and even animal life, plant life. Looking more specifically uh, in this region, you can see why uh, Israel is much more desirable as far as growing season goes uh, compared to Syria, Jordan, and Egypt. And while these lands uh, Arab-controlled territories are vast. Uh, they are sparse population. So there's uh, that ever-growing tension of the uh, Arabic people having much of a desire 
for the lamb that was described to um, Abraham as being a land flowing with milk and honey. And we can see that contrast uh, very clearly in this image. Now, to understand why there uh, are such vast differences, let's look on a global scale and take a moment to try to understand prevailing winds. Now, I want to encourage you to uh, pause and read the article that I presented in this lesson regarding the climates. And I want you to read in detail what I'm just going to summarize in this lecture as far as the trade winds. But allow me to uh, describe it this way. As the Earth rotates on its axis, and in this diagram you would see the Earth spinning from the left to the right, the atmosphere around the Earth is being affected by the Earth's rotation. When the atmosphere is attempting to be more stationary and the Earth is spinning, the um, amount of speed of the rotation is experienced most at the equator. In other words, if you were to spin a globe and put your finger up near the Arctic Circle, the globe would feel as though it was turning slowly. But as you move your finger down from the uh, North Pole to the equator, you would experience uh, the speed of the Earth would appear to be a lot faster. While the rotation is the same, uh, that precise location would have more friction against your finger at the equator. As that happens, it would appear as though the air in the atmosphere would be resisting the rotation of the Earth, and it would appear as though the air is moving to the left. As you have that prevailing wind at the equator, uh, in this diagram, moving to the left, the way it appears, um, then there would also be a counteractive flow of air, that as the air gets superheated at the equator, the air is going to rise. Notice the red arrows along the equator, and on the left-hand side of the diagram, you have gray arrows. As the air is superheated in the tropics along the equator, it rises. As it rises and gets farther away from the Earth, it cools. Uh, it cools uh, to the point uh, air Airlines, when they travel long distances, they climb into elevations uh, at 30,000 feet would be close to 60 degrees below zero. You may not realize that, but if you go on a long flight, uh, it might be 30 to 60 degrees below zero outside of the aircraft. As superheated air in the tropics rise, to that higher elevation with less air pressure, lower temperatures, they release practically all of their water. And as they then cycle back down to the earth, they are very dry. As they cycle back down, if we're looking at the norm, northern hemisphere, notice the gray area to the left points as though it's going down to the uh, 30th parallel and of latitude, and as it comes down on the, uh, the 30th parallel, it is very dry, and it is ready to pick up moisture from any warm air that it would, uh, or warm water that it would be exposed to, and ready to pick up um, uh, moisture to make clouds. We see this all around the globe, but specifically, we're going to talk about how this affects the climate in the Middle East. As we look at the cloud cover, let's focus on the middle of Africa. As you can see, the Sahara Desert in the middle of this diagram has very little clouds. The dotted lines indicate, the middle dotted line indicates the equator. And think of that circular airflow as 
warm air rises over the equator and then it drops back down on the 30th parallel shown as this red dot in the center of Africa. As it forces down, you have land that is superheated because there's not very many clouds in the Sahara Desert. And this dry air comes down upon uh, the middle of that desert region. So now you have uh, superheated dry air and there is no chance of moisture to accumulate in that region even uh, if there would be a storm system that would try to bring moisture in the water would never reach the ground. Now as we consider the Middle East you would see that that, um, that air that's coming down over the 30th parallel a portion of it goes across the Mediterranean Sea and as it's coming back down it's now going west to east across the Mediterranean Sea which would bring it from the Mediterranean Sea moisture clouds into the region of the Middle East. The problem is that cloud cover doesn't travel very far because of the landform specifically the Judean mountains. So before we leave this slide, I want you to appreciate the prevailing winds, the direction of the winds. Uh, these are the same prevailing winds that um, travelers used as they were exploring during the ages of the, uh, the Spanish and the Portuguese, uh, Christopher Columbus, as they were uh, traveling westward they would go down to the 30th parallel or near the 30th parallel where they would find prevailing winds blowing from east to west and they would um, sail easily across the Atlantic Ocean and land in the Caribbean then they would go up the eastern seaboard of what we now call the Americas and then catch the west to easter eastern um, winds that would take them back to Europe. And these prevailing winds were highly predictable as far as direction, but they were not predictable necessarily as far as consistency. For any time you have a high pressure area and the, the dry air is coming down from the upper atmosphere, you can come uh, across times where the, the breeze will stop or pause, and you could go for days with no breeze at all, what, which would be quite concerning if you were in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean on a, a sailing vessel. But if you could uh, ride out the doldrum, if you would, the calm period, then uh, that breeze would pick back up and you would have safe journey across. So understand the prevailing winds by reading the article and my description is not enough you need to read my article so that way you can get a full understanding understand that the prevailing winds in the Middle East uh, are from the west to the east actually it's more um, to the northeast the air is traveling over the hot Sahara Desert and this super hot dry air coming off of Africa's desert coming then across the Mediterranean Sea picking up moisture from the Mediterranean Sea and then landing on the shores of Israel and because of that prevailing weather pattern we have a very lush lush um, uh, growing season and that combined with fertile ground is why it's considered part of the Fertile Crescent. So I'm going to ask you to pause now and uh, read your articles. I also want you to read the article on the Dead Sea uh, being the most unique environment on Earth. And after you've read those articles, I'm going to ask you to then come back and finish this presentation. Now let us continue. The Dead Sea is a beautiful area that has marvelous waters and it looks uh, like the Caribbean uh, as far as translucent uh, aqua colors uh, then surrounded by salt 
and uh, salt is plenteous in the area, but it's not just salt. There's all forms of minerals there, which has uh, made the area so special. Um, there's a very productive industry of fertilizer and um, skin creams, uh, medicines, um, north, north, near the southern rim of the Dead Sea. There are companies in Jordan and companies in Israel that are world famous for their special uh, mineral enriched products. The Dead Sea itself is considered a toxic, dangerous sea. Um, you can swim, but it would be better to say float in the Dead Sea. Um, but there are signs that says do not put your face in the water for uh, the water is so concentrated with uh, toxins and minerals that it's very unsafe and can be dangerous uh, for those who would get that water in their mouth. Nevertheless, people often go in and float and keep their face out of the water. And because of the concentration of minerals in the water, um, the water is very dense, which makes it easy to float. Uh, you float much higher up uh, your body up out of the water more in the Dead Sea than typical water, again, because of the density, the concentration of minerals in the water. Why is it such a concentration? Because all of the water primarily coming from the Jordan River, all of the fresh water that pours into the Dead Sea, because it's the lowest place on Earth, it has no place to drain to, and it would grow an elevation of water. However, it is so hot at the Dead Sea that water evaporates. And in the recent years, it has been evaporating at a rate that is much greater than the amount of water that's being added to it. So you see these vast deposits of minerals. And if, if you look closely at this picture, you can see the seashore used to be a lot higher uh, up on the land mass. And indeed, uh, over the last uh, several years, the, uh, the elevation, the height of the Sea of Galilee has diminished and it's continuing to go down. We'll talk more about that in just a few moments. But understanding the climate at the Dead Sea, it is an arid desert yet water is evaporating from the sea rapidly. How can you have rapid evaluate, uh, evaporation, yet have dry, arid land? This dry climate is special in history because the Qumran caves, the Dead Sea caves with the scrolls of the oldest copies of the Bible, were preserved and made available to our generations today because of this special, unique environment. Parchmouth, um, enclosed in uh, clay canisters beneath the, um, the, the earth in caves, could not exist uh, for a long period of time, 2,000 years, unless they were in a very arid land. And that's exactly what the Dead Sea has provided. Who knows what other archaeological finds may uh, someday surface uh, around the Dead Sea just because um, leather and parchment paper goods uh, can survive long periods of time in this extremely unique environment. Now, why is this environment so unique? Well, we're going to talk about a concept that's... Uh, occurs various places in the world, but not to the extreme position of Israel. Uh, it's called the orographic effect, and uh, you can also call it the orographic lift, meaning the weather patterns that come from the Mediterranean Sea, while it's uh, very uh, special for the western half of the nation of Israel, uh, if the water cannot get to the Dead Sea because of the higher elevations, then uh, there may be clouds, as shown in this, uh, in this picture, 
but the clouds are so thin they don't have enough moisture in them for rain to reach the surface. Before the rain coming from these clouds, if there would be precip precip precipitation coming down, um, it would evaporate before it reaches the land. And we're going to talk more about that orographic uh, lift uh, phenomenon, but I want you to understand that the Dead Sea is the most unique place in the world. There uh, is This is the lowest elevation. This is the most naturally occurring toxic water uh, due to the concentration of minerals. And it is uh, on the extreme end of uninhabitable, but yet the northern end of the Jordan River is considered to be one of the most uh, precious climates and productive climates. In fact, if you go uh, north and higher elevation into the Golan Heights in the area of Mount Hermon, uh, certainly it is considered one of the most fertile regions. If we had a clear day at the Dead Sea, we could see snow-capped Mount Hermon from the Dead Sea. How do you go from that, from one extreme of a beautiful snow-capped mountain, which has snow most of the year, to the lowest and uh, least inhabitable locations on Earth? Well, again, it's the combination of the prevailing winds and this orographic lift. Now let's look more specifically at an illustration. I've added to this general illustration um, the reference to the Mediterranean Sea and uh, the, the fertile land in the uh, western side of Israel referred to as the Shefla. And then on the right-hand side of this diagram, I'm referring to the Dead Sea, the nation of Jordan, the Arabian Desert. And while this is an exaggerated illustration, it uh, is effective in teaching the concept of orographic lift. Now, if you remember, earlier in this presentation, I said the prevailing winds coming uh, into the Middle East are traveling from the southwest to the northeast. As uh, dry air comes down from the higher elevations onto the Sahara Desert, then travels across the Mediterranean Sea, those superheated dry winds pick up much moisture from the Mediterranean Sea. Those thick, heavy clouds then, if you would, crash into the Judean mountains, uh, the region around Jerusalem. And on the western side of the Judean mountains, uh, those heavy clouds drop their moisture because they are forced to rise in elevation. They're going from sea level uh, to higher elevations very quickly. And as they go to higher elevations to clear the, the mountain range, they have lower atmospheric pressure and colder temperatures, forcing them to condense their water vapor, drop their rain, and as they uh, scrape over the Judean mountain landscape, and when you spend the day in Jerusalem on a rainy day, you feel as though the, the cloud cover is going just over your head, and it literally is as it's clearing the uh, Judean mountains, once those clouds clear the mountains, they have uh, lost their capacity to hold their water. They, there are still clouds, but there's not enough moisture to produce rain. They naturally, because they've now been cooled, you have cool air at that higher elevation, they now naturally drop down the eastern side of the Judean mountain range, and that forms the barren, dry Judean wilderness. That would be the same wilderness that Jesus traveled in on the eastern side of the Judean mountains. And this dry air, as it's coming down the eastern side of the mountain slope, descends to the Dead Sea. And now with all of the heat 
uh, and the direct sunlight because there's not very much cloud in the area of the Dead Sea, the area gets very hot. These cool breezes are now superheated again. They have the capacity to absorb much water again, so the water evaporates very quickly out of the Dead Sea. And as the prevailing winds continue to, to force the clouds toward the east, they are then forced to climb up higher, even higher than the Judean mountains, to uh, then go over the Jordanian mountains on the eastern side of the Sea of Galilee. And once again, trying to climb over that mountain range, they are forced to release all of their water. They then uh, have deluges in the region of Jordan, causes much erosion in the soft, chalky base mountains of uh, Jordan, and then the water comes back into the Dead Sea, and from Jordan you see this ongoing rinsing of the minerals and erosion back into the Dead Sea, making the Dead Sea even more concentrated. Once this same cloud system gets over the Jordanian mountains east of the Dead Sea, they now travel over the nation of Jordan, the Arabian Desert, they have no capacity again to hold moisture for rain, and that's why you have the Arabian Desert. Now when you're standing in the region of the Dead Sea, you can't really appreciate everything that's happening, but when you look at this diagram, you can. If you look to the west of the Jordan River and look at the Judean wilderness, uh, it's made up of mountains that are limestone base mountains. And while there, uh, you see erosion, you also see many um, oases, many even waterfalls that's coming out of this limestone basin. How would these waterfalls occur when there's no rain on the eastern side of the mountain? Well, because the Judean mountains are primarily limestone. And limestone, just as it does in southern Ohio and Virginia and Kentucky, limestone um, erodes when exposed to rainwater. The acid in rain, uh, naturally occurring acid even in rain, uh, dissolves limestone, causing forming cave systems, like in our region, Carter Caves, and far, a little farther away, Mammoth Caves. Well, there are many limestone caves in the Judean mountains. And as the rain falls on the western side, most of the rain in the Judean mountains uh, travels back to the Mediterranean Sea. But a large portion of the rain gets caught up into the cave system, subterranean water systems, and they eventually come out the eastern side of the Judean mountains. So you have this, uh, this phenomenon of the Judean desert on the eastern side of the Judean mountains is hot, uninhabitable, but yet there are oases gushing with fresh flowing water, artesian springs. And it's places like En Gedi, where David was hiding in the caves from Saul. It was a barren wasteland. Elijah, the same thing. Hiding in caves, he had plenty of fresh water, and as long as there was a way for someone to bring food, they could stay and hide in those caves in a barren desert for a long time. Now, if you look to the eastern side of the Jordan River, you don't have the same phenomenon because of the chalky mountains. They're not limestone mountains. They're more of a chalky base, softer mountains. They erode, and they look more like a reddish lunar landscape. Now, keep in mind, as we spoke earlier in this course, the Jordan Rift Valley is truly the separation of two tectonic plates, and it would be, uh, I believe, more fair to consider uh, the the side of Israel on the Jordan River to be more of Africa and the side of Jordan on the eastern side, um, Asia. And as these two plates, continents, are rubbing up against each other, they are made up of different forms of rock. And if you add to this the volcanic activity that's going on underneath the whole region, you have a very diverse ecosystem involved. So. Um, 
I, I'm hoping that if you take the time to read articles and, and, and really do some of your own research on this, you'll come to a great uh, appreciation that the Dead Sea is in an, an area that we would call a rain shadow, as mentioned on the previous slide. Um, when you have a light shadow, it would mean the absence of light. We're in a rain shadow, it's the absence of rain, as shown in this diagram. And you can see how you just traveling over the top of the mountain ridge in just a short distance, you can go from uh, rich, lush, growing uh, land, good for agriculture, to barren wasteland, all because of this phenomenon referred to as orographic lift. The name orographic comes from the Greek word oros, meaning mountain. And for our last slide, uh, I had mentioned the uh, problem with the Dead Sea is there's too much water being used um, by um, civilizations uh, north of the uh, Dead Sea where settlements use uh, fresh water, agricultural, industrial applications, um, dam up water, and keep it from getting into the Jordan River. And because of the increasing use of water before it enters the Jordan River, we see the evaporation rate of the Dead Sea is exceeding the rate that water is supplied. If this continues, the Dead Sea will dry up and it will be non-existent. And being such a special place in the world and a travel location, Neither the, the countries of Jordan or Israel want to see this happen. So for years, there has been a discussion about a joint project that would build a pipeline from Elat uh, down at the Red Sea, the, the Gulf of Aqaba, and it would travel uh, to the Dead Sea and make up the deficiency of water with seawater. Now, certainly there could be some economic uh, side effects, or not economic, but ecological side effects from this, and we certainly don't know what that will be until a project would go forth. And the project has been delayed for generations because this is you know, clearly one of the uh, most uh, politically unstable regions of the world with more military conflict than any other region. Hard to get a a, a bank or a group of investors to decide to invest in such a project. But uh, at the time of developing this course, at the end of 2017, uh, there had been what appears to be a, an approval with the nations of Jordan and Israel and the World Bank to finance this worthwhile project. And as you can see in the diagram, that's uh, considered the Red Dead Sea Pipeline Project, that the pipeline would be uh, remain on the Jordanian side of the, uh, the border between Israel and Jordan. And it makes sense for it to be on the Jordanian side because the Jordanian people benefit from this pipeline more than the Israeli uh, population. The people in Israel uh, already have water systems coming from the west. Uh, to supply sufficient water, um, at least in Israeli-controlled territories. Now, that may not be the case very often in uh, West Bank territories, but the Jordanian people have a great need. They are one of the most water-impoverished nations in the world. And as you look at this, the, uh, the goal would be to pump water out of the Red Sea for just a short distance to get um, up over a higher elevation, and once you get uh, clear of the higher elevation uh, around Elat, it is all uh, downhill uh, because the Dead Sea is 1,400 feet below the sea level of the Red Sea, so it would be easy for the water to have a natural flow, and um, there would also be enough head pressure in the water flowing down the uh, piping system 
that you could generate some electricity with hydropower units. And of course, you always have the opportunity for solar powered systems in the region because there's not very many clouds in the region. So there would be plenty of opportunity to develop electricity, to operate desalination plants, making purified water in a region of the world where there's very little water, and then also uh, use that pipeline to supplement the water that's necessary to maintain adequate sea levels in the Dead Sea. So uh, it's very possible that during our lifetime we will see this project go into effect and uh, just watch the news and see how uh, the environmental impact of the uh, Dead Sea Basin uh, is affected with this change. So that's what we wanted to discuss with the climates as we close. Um, just remember that the animal life and the plant life in northern Israel in higher elevations is highly desirable, yet as you go farther south in the land of Israel, it's a lot less tolerable. It's more of the um, the land of wandering in the wilderness, the desert, for 40 years, looking forward to the promised land, the land flowing with milk and honey. And as you look at this map, uh, where the word Israel was written just south of that uh, region is uh, the location of Kadesh Barnea, and that is the area where the spies would have traveled north and they would have traveled out of the desert where Moses and the people were, and they would have had an unexplainable phenomenon of seeing beautiful, lush farmland that we call the Shefla, and uh, growing marvelous crops. And they didn't have to exaggerate when they said how marvelous they were, and they would come back to the people standing in the desert just a, a short distance away and explain that this is a... Uh, special region, and certainly they would consider it to be uh, something supernatural as they couldn't explain the ecosystems. This is something that is specially blessed by God, and it all fits into God's plan. So I hope that this is a uh, enriching understanding of why the different climates and landforms creates such different ecosystems and explains to our better understanding why this land is considered the land flowing with milk and honey. Thank you very much, class. We'll talk to you next time.